So we've been in a series of messages uh, called Deployed. And Pastor Mark has been telling us and talking to us about putting on Jesus and being, having the armor of God, having on what we need to live out this life that he has given us, that he's purposed for us. Um, and as when he asked me to speak, I knew he was gonna be in this series of messages. And um, I, it was actually kind of easy to know my direction because back in December, about a week or so before Christmas, you know, the holidays, there's so much going on. And I was feeling a little tired, a little overwhelmed. We had Christmas Eve services coming up, just a lot to do. And I remember late one night or early in the morning, um, just saying, man, Lord, I just, I don't know if I have the energy to, to do the rest of this. And he brought a verse to mind that I actually memorized when I was probably eight years old. And the verse is Psalms 23, verse one. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I always look up how different versions say verses. And another version said, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. And since that night in December, the Psalms 23 has just been on my heart. I just can't, I can't get it out, get it out of my head. And I've been studying it and reading it and, and just quoting it over and over and over at all times of the day. And it's just been a real blessing. And, and as I've read through it, I've realized that it really is a blueprint for how to be deployed. It's really a blueprint for living this life um, as followers of Christ. So I want us just to read through it real quick uh, because there's power in the word of God and there's power in speaking the word of God into the atmosphere, I believe. So Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures he leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Father, I just pray as I try to convey what this chapter has meant to me really over my lifetime, but even more so in the last couple of months, I just pray that you would bless it, Lord, that you would speak through me, Father, I pray that you would just prepare our hearts to hear from you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm, I wanna approach this message today. The title of my message under deployed is Deployment Blueprint. Psalms 23 is our deployment blueprint. How to live this life, how to put on Jesus and live all that he's, all that he's given us. My first point is who to follow. This Psalms tells us who to follow and it just comes right out of the gate and David tells us in verse one, Psalms 23 verse one, the Lord is my shepherd. Why does David use that as, as the metaphor? I mean, shepherd of all things, but if you don't know who David is, David was a shepherd. He was a shepherd boy before he became king of Israel. So he's very familiar with shepherds. He's very familiar with sheep. And I think he, he knew he could convey what the Lord had put on his heart through using that metaphor. And John 10 verse 11 says, and this is Jesus speaking, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. So the Lord is my shepherd. If you're like me and you wanna learn something, you Google it, right? I don't really know how accurate that is in learning things, but so I Googled what is, a good shepherd. And I, ha I read article after article that talked about different characteristics of a good shepherd. And I just picked a few because there were, there were a lot of them, but I just picked a few that would hopefully 
um, help you to understand why it's important we know who to follow. So characteristic of a good shepherd. A good shepherd leads. Now I think it's interesting with sheep that shepherds don't drive. You know, you have, have you ever heard of a cattle drive or seen it in a movie where the cattle are running and the cowboy's behind them and yelling and hooping and hollering and he's driving the cattle? Well, that's not how a shepherd leads. Um, a shepherd goes in front of the sheep and leads them. He doesn't coerce them. He doesn't beat them. He invites them to follow him. Uh, John 10 verse three says, the gatekeeper opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And we have a picture here of the shepherd standing outside the gate of the pen. And one thing, I don't know if you've ever heard this, but sheep actually don't have very good eyesight, but they have really, really good hearing. In fact, the articles I read said they have excellent, it's a strength, their hearing is a strength. So they're in the pen and the shepherd stands outside the gate and he calls them. He opens the gate, he calls them to come and they just, they follow the voice of the shepherd. And the shepherd leads them. Isaiah 40 verse 11 says, and it's speaking of Jesus, he will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms he will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are young. It's just the picture of such a good, kind, gentle leader. A good shepherd also provides. Verse two of Psalms 23 says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. And it's interesting because the uh, environment that David uh, lived in was Israel. And it's a lot like Arizona, where there's a lot of uh, dry, rocky, hilly terrain. It's not really a green, lush, uh, there's not green meadows just everywhere. It's, it's more that desert feel. So if a sheep come to a green pasture, their first instinct isn't going to be to lie down. Their first instinct is going to eat that grass because it's, it's not you know, a common thing for them to see. So I think in here, what we see is that when a sheep will lie down in a green pasture, it means they're undistracted. Sheep are very skittish and, and you know, easily frightened. They're undistracted, they're unafraid, and they're full, they're satisfied, they're not hungry. So when he says, he makes me lie down in green pastures, it's saying that Jesus, the good shepherd, has provided everything I need. I'm full, I'm satisfied, and I lie down and rest. So then a good shepherd protects. John 10, seven says, therefore Jesus said again, verily, verily, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. And we also already talked about the gate, but the gate is a mode of protection. I mean, if you, if you have uh, dogs and you have a fenced in yard, you know that if you leave the gate open, then that opens them to, to run away, get hurt. It opens the opportunity for predators to come in. So Jesus here is saying, I'm your protection. I'm, I'm the gate. And then a good shepherd sacrifices. John 10, uh, Skipping on down a little bit to verse 11 says, and again, Jesus is speaking, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and he runs away. And then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I actually read a, an article that said that a lot of times shepherds they would have the gate to the pen and they would close the gate, but then the shepherd would actually lie down in front of the gate as even more of a defense for the sheep so that if that wolf came and was heading toward the gate, they would attack the shepherd first. And a good shepherd, because he loved the flock, he cared for them, they were really his, his family, he was willing to sacrifice himself for those sheep. So this is the good shepherd. This is who David says from the very beginning, this is who we follow. The Lord is my shepherd. 
Well, if this blueprint shows us who to follow, then does it tell us where to follow? And, and I believe it does. So my second point is where to follow. And I'm gonna jump back to a verse that I've already talked about, Psalms 23, verse two. It says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. This means waters of rest. So it, Psalms just starts right off with saying, the shepherd is going to lead you to abundance. The shepherd is going to lead you to peace. And then he goes on and says, he leads me in the paths of righteousness, or he leads me in the right way. He leads me into truth. And I think that's so important in this day and age when, when we're trying to figure out what the truth is, what the truth is for our own lives, for our kids, what direction to take. This says that the good shepherd leads you in the right path that you should take. And then we get to verse four and it says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Well, hang on now. I was doing fine. I liked the green pastures. I liked the calm waters. The valley of the shadow of death. Does that mean if I follow Jesus, the good shepherd, he's going to lead me to the valley of the shadow of death? Well, we live, we're human. We live in this fallen world. It's really not a matter of if we're gonna hit a valley, it's a matter of when. And there are going to be valleys. Just because we follow Jesus doesn't keep us out of the valleys. When I was a kid, and again, I you know, was probably eight or nine when I memorized this Psalm, I, I remember thinking, what's the big deal about a shadow? Shadows can't hurt you. I, I mean, that doesn't sound real scary to me. Until you understand that sheep have, like I said earlier, very limited vision. They don't see well. So when they see a shadow, they don't have the ability to perceive whether or not that's a real predator or if it's simply a shadow. So when they see the shadow, it frightens them because they assume it's a predator. It's, out, it's something that's going to get them. It's something that's going to hurt them. And then and the more I study, because again, so much of scripture, to really, really understand, it's, you know, they used a different language then. There are words that, that mean different to us now than they did then. So I, I began to look up, what does this mean, the valley of the shadow of death? And it actually means the valley of deep darkness, a valley of darkest gloom. So the picture here in my mind is a valley of such deep, deep darkness that you can't see your hand in front of your face. It's a place of uh, uncertainty. You don't know with that next step what you're gonna run to, where you're gonna fall off of, you know. It's, it's really, it is a frightening place. It's an uncertain place. It's a, it's a dark place. And then David jumps right from the valley of the shadow of death to verse five that says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And, and that in the presence of my enemies literally means right in front. Your enemies are right there, almost close enough to touch. And Mike and Debbie know they're not my enemies. But that's the idea of it. It's right there. Whoever's against you, whatever circumstance seems to be overpowering you, um, whatever fear you have in your life, it's right here. It's close, it's way too close for comfort. So, you know, I feel like the Psalm was going pretty good. The Lord is my shepherd and he leads me to green pastures he leads me to still waters, and those are such great moments and places to be. He leads me in the right path. But then we hit the valley of the shadow of death, and then we hit enemies. So 
You know, that's about 60-40. 60% of the time, he's gonna lead you into something that's positive. And 40% of the time, it's not gonna be so much fun. So I'm not, <laughs> do I follow this good shepherd? Yes. <laughs> and my third point is why, why to follow? And the why actually in Psalms 23 is in every single verse. So I'm gonna start back up at the beginning again. Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Other versions say I shall not lack, I have everything I need. And I'll be honest, I just, I'm a very literal person, I mean really almost to the point of it's not good that I'm so literal. It makes directions really hard because I really need like 250 feet and then you turn left or I get lost. So I'm lost all the time when I'm driving. But I look at scripture very literally. So the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I need. And I'll tell you what, I, I struggled with that. You know, I'm very aware of just some horrible things that happen in this life. There are millions of people who are caught in human trafficking. There are young girls out there right now, today, caught in sex trafficking. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We just have heard of those horrible earthquakes in Turkey. I read last night where over 46,000 people so far have died and they're estimating that number will go above 200,000 when it's all said and done. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need. And then I read a story that Samaritan's Purse put out and Samaritan's Purse is an organization that we help a lot. When you give to this church, one of the organizations that you help is Samaritan's Purse. Samaritan's has established a temporary hospital in Turkey. Their government actually asked Samaritan's to come in. So they have an emergency field hospital there and they're caring for the victims of these earthquakes. And they told the story of a 14 year old boy who was buried in the rubble. And for the first few days after the earthquake, he heard the voice of his brother and he and his brother talked back and forth. And one day his brother's voice stopped. Days later, they rescued this 14 year old boy from the rubble. And he comes out to discover that his entire family has been wiped out. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need. How do, you, how do you tell people that who are facing a difficult diagnosis? How do you tell people that who have lost loved ones, maybe not even through death, but just through a broken relationship? How do you tell that to someone who's just grieving to depths that you can't understand? The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything that I need. And that was, as I began to study that, that was really my beginning. I'm like, Lord, I know in my heart that I have everything I need because of you. I know that. But sometimes, you know, you just don't understand. But I really, really feel like Psalms 23 tells you why to follow Jesus. It's not because in our, in our selfishness, what we think when we read that, the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything that I need. What we read it as is the Lord is my shepherd, I have everything I want. That's what we really wanted to say. But what it's saying is, because God Almighty, the one who created us, 
the one who spoke this world into existence, the one who knows every thought, every pain, every sorrow. He is everything. And because he is my shepherd, because of him, I have everything. I have everything I need because he is everything. And then you go to verse two. Again, why follow this good shepherd? He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters because he provides, he brings peace and calm. So much anxiety in this world today. The good shepherd takes you to those still waters. He brings peace. He restores my soul. That word restores means to revive, to resurrect. It's actually saying he takes dead things and brings them to life. (laughs) That's a good reason to follow the good shepherd. It doesn't matter what's dead in your life. It doesn't matter if there's a dead relationship in your life. It doesn't matter if there is a diagnosis that equals death. He restores our soul. He revives. That's a pretty good reason to follow the good shepherd. And then he leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. I read somewhere once where we, we make thousands of decisions every day. Some of those decisions are easy and some are just really, really hard. Follow the good shepherd. He leads you in the right path. And then verse four, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yea, though I walk through the valley of deep darkness and darkest gloom. But you see the answers in that verse too as to why we follow him. It's in one word. Yea, though I walk through. He leads us through. He's not gonna stop halfway in when we're at our lowest point. He's not gonna stop at the point where we start to say, we start to question following him. He's not gonna stop. He's faithful to walk us through, to lead us to the other side. And remember, it's so dark, you can't even see in front of you. He sees it, he knows it, he's leading us. He's gonna walk us through. I will fear no evil. Can you imagine a life with zero fear, zero worry, zero anxiety. That's what Psalms 23 is saying. No, none. We think of evil as, you know, the horrible things that are happening with sex trafficking, with things like that. But he's he's saying, I fear nothing because you are with me because you walk with me. It says, I fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod and the staff of the shepherd, the rod is a big club. It's a big club that the shepherd uses to beat off the enemies, to conk the wolf over the head when he's starting to attack the sheep. The picture of the staff is a gentler picture. I read one article where it said the staff is often just like an extension of the shepherd. He's so good at using it. And, and when sheep, again, because they're afraid of the dark, when they're going into the pen at night, they're afraid to go into the pen where it's safe, where they're protected because they can't see. And the shepherd knows it's the best thing for them. So he takes the staff and he just touches their side with it. And when they feel that staff, they know it's dark, but that's the good shepherd. He's right there. And he's telling me it's okay to go this direction. So he gently nudges them. What a sweet picture of grace. He tells them this is where to go. So your rod protects me. 
Your staff directs me, comforts me. Verse five, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And as I said, I mean, I, 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 there are so many words I think, okay, table, you know what that means. But as you, when you start to read it and really learn about it, the idea of, you, you guys know, have you ever heard the term circling the wagons? You know, in the old Western movies, the settlers were riding their covered wagons across the country and then, you know, bad people would start to chase them and they would circle their wagons and they'd all get inside of that circle and they would fight from that position. The idea of a table set before the presence of my enemies is the idea of battle formation. The table is is part of the battle. You're in the battle. And, And Jesus just comes and says, okay, we're gonna circle the wagons here. We're gonna set the table in the presence of my enemies. The problem is still there. The grief is still there. The hardship is still there. And Jesus says, here's a table. That table represents protection and abundance It represents the presence of the Lord there in the midst of everything you're walking through. And then you jump to the last part of verse five that says, you anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Picture here is gladness and joy and abundance. It's Jesus saying, here's the table full of abundance The enemy can't take what I've provided. And you're gonna have joy and abundance and gladness in the midst, in the valley, in the presence. And the last verse, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Surely, that word, it doesn't mean, oh, maybe, you'll have some good things or there'll be some things. That word surely means only. Only goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. The Lord is my shepherd. Only goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. Okay, there's another why. <laughs> why not follow him? And then the last part of that verse, and that's, this is probably why we use it at funerals so much. It says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As I read that and as I really meditated on that verse, I just, honestly, I thought there's, there's gotta be something more here than what I just usually think of. And I looked up again, I, I, I wanna know the literal meaning of things. So I looked up the word forever and it means length, like long, like a measurement. It's the same word that's used in the Old Testament when God is telling Noah how to build the ark and he's giving them measurements. And he says the length of the ark is 300 cubits. That word length, it's the same as this word forever. And then when he's telling the children of Israel to build the temple, and he says, the length of each curtain is 28 cubits. It's the same word here. And when he's talking about the Ark of the Covenant and the measurements of the Ark of the Covenant, and it says two and a half cubits long, it's talking about length. This is what I concluded. I know scripture, oh, it talks about eternity. Our, our Security as believers is knowing that we are going to spend eternity in heaven with the Lord. I'm thankful, I'm grateful, and that gives me hope every single day. But Psalms 23, in my opinion, is saying that this is for today. This is for the length of our days. So I will dwell, I will remain, I will inhabit the house of the Lord, his presence. Do you know Noah's Ark and the temple, the Ark of the Covenant, all those things represent his presence. So what I think David is really saying here 
is after I have followed Jesus, I will walk in his presence every single day of my life. Why, why should we follow Jesus? Well, I think all those reasons, they, they outweigh the valleys. There's, there's hope in this and there's joy in this. There's abundance in this. The one, one last thing that I just, that I thought was real interesting as I studied was about halfway through that Psalm, David's tone changes a little bit. You know, the first part is, uh, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me by still waters. He leads me to green pastures. He leads me to paths of righteousness. And then when you get to verse four, David says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. And it becomes personal. It becomes a little bit more intimate as you're reading it. And the reason I, I think there's that shift there is because David has throughout his life followed the shepherd. He has followed the lordship of Christ. And because he has followed the lordship of Christ, he now enters into friendship with Christ. Because I, I believe that lordship has to precede friendship. We want the we want the green pastures, we want the still waters, we, we want the abundance, the joy, but we're not willing to make him Lord. But when we make him Lord, there is friendship that we, can, we, can't, we can't imagine. There's, there's abundance, there's, there's presence. When we, when we learn to obey the Lord, when we learn to obey the Lord in the midst of our circumstances, in the presence of our enemies, in the presence of the dark valley, in the midst of the dark valley, when we, need, when we learn to obey what he's saying when it's tough, we enter his presence. We sit at the table with him. But it requires lordship. It requires obedience. But the reward, I wish I, could, I wish I could measure it. I wish I could say enough to convince you. And that's why I'm thankful for the presence of the Holy Spirit because he says and he does what I lack. Is the Lord your shepherd? Will you bow your heads with me? What is the Holy Spirit saying to you? Do you know the shepherd? If you don't know him today in this very moment, you can put your faith in him. You can say this prayer. Lord, I confess with my mouth that I've never followed you. I believe in my heart that you are the good, good shepherd. I place my trust in you. I turn from all the things that I followed in the past and I turn to you, Jesus. I ask you to come into my heart, save me. I surrender all to you. If you prayed that prayer with every head bowed, would you mind just lifting your hand up real quick so that I can one, rejoice with you, and two, pray for you. Jesus is such a good shepherd. Thank you. And then my next question for those of us who 
follow Jesus? Are there areas in your life that the Holy Spirit is nudging you that you need to follow him? That gentle nudge of his staff to say, you're not really in that right path. You need to go this way a little bit or that way a little bit more. My prayer for you is that you stop resisting because his way is it's so much better. There's so, there's so much freedom in his way. And I know that following Jesus is not always a bed of roses. I know just a few of your stories. And I know that some of you are suffering I know that some of you are hurting. I know that some of you are confused as to what path to take. I know some of you are desperate for answers and you feel like you've cried out for them over and over and you're just not getting them. I know some of you are grieving, grieving the loss of people you hold dear, Places. Some of you are new to this area. You've left the familiar behind and you're grieving. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the presence of the Lord forever. Jesus, we need you. I need you. I need to learn to be more dependent on you. I want your presence. I desperately want your presence. Lord, will you just help us to depend on you more? Will you help us to put aside our own desires and our own wants and just submit to your Lordship? Will you help us to obey that thing that you've been telling us to do and we've resisted and we've resisted and we've resisted? Will you help us to obey? Give us the strength and the wisdom and the courage just to follow and let you do the hard work. Our altar team's gonna come in just a moment. If you need prayer for any reason, if you're in that valley and you need someone to hold, hold your hand, and encourage you through their prayer, come and have prayer. If you have a decision that you just cannot, cannot see the answer to, would you come and allow them to pray for you? There is power, there's power in prayer. And there's power in brothers and sisters coming together and admitting our need and saying, Jesus, I need you. So would you stand as I just pray one more time? Heavenly Father, I love you. There's so much in this passage. I want to learn even more. But more than anything, I want to learn more dependence on the Holy Spirit. I want to learn more lordship in my life. So Father, just help us so that our friendship with Jesus can just deepen and grow. What a good friend you are.